This is Linda Fitzgerald. Welcome to the SBDC webinar on fostering customer loyalty in a changing marketplace. We are so glad you're here. Thank you so much for joining us. This is the Shasta Cascade SBDC. We provide no cost confidential one on one advisory services for entrepreneurs and small businesses in both Shasta and Trinity counties. And we also offer no cost or low cost workshops and webinars just like this one. We're funded by the US Small Business Administration, the state of California, and HSU. There, we realize we have a lot more people visit than just our two counties that we support. So if you're from outside the area, we're so glad you're able to join us today. Thank you for being here. And we want you to know that there are SBDC locations all throughout the US. So if you are in the US, you can go to Google and search for SBDC location and find one near you because they are there for you. And it does not cost you anything to get your training because you've already paid for it, excuse me, advising. You've already paid for it with your tax dollars. So it's free to your business. So please do take advantage of meeting with one of the advisors here trained to help you. And for today's session, I would like to introduce you to Lonnie. Lonnie, take it away. Hey. There's my photo. Um, one thing I learned, uh, I was, I took, a, as with everybody else, I'm using a lot of this time to upscale my skills. And I took an advanced LinkedIn uh, course. And the first thing they said was, make sure that your picture is professional and current on your LinkedIn. And well, I looked at mine and it was probably from high school, but not really. So this is the most current picture of myself. So. You do get to see me live though when I, we're doing these webinars. I am the president of LL Consulting. Um, it is a woman owned business. I've owned it and operated it for 20 years. Primarily my focus of consulting is economic development and downtown revitalization. So I work with communities like Truckee, like small communities like Reading, helping them shear up their downtown districts, their historic areas so that it becomes a really strong environment for small businesses to thrive and build their businesses. And then parallel to that, for eight years, I have been consulting with the Shasta Cascade Small Business Development Center. Prior to that, over the last 20 years, I also worked um, for about 10 years with Nevada County, Placer County, and El Dorado County, and did some consulting up in Truckee, Erin. So that was interesting that you said you're up in, uh, in Truckee. Um, I work with in my advising practice for the Small Business Development Center. I'm kind of considered a generalist, but I really focus a lot on market research and business feasibility. So when businesses are looking at starting out, how do they do market research to see if there's a market for their product or services? What's the competition? Help them develop their business plan and then work with businesses all along their growth um, cycle, whether it's a pre-venture startup, uh, in business, looking at succession planning. And then over the last couple of years, I've really become kind of excited and I love uh, marketing and promotional strategies. So that's kind of me. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to look for my bar down here. There we go. I'm going to go ahead and stop my video because I talk a lot with my hands. And when I'm in person, you will um, see me talk a lot with my uh, hands, but when it, you're doing a virtual workshop, it can be kind of distracting. So I'm, for this one, I'm gonna go ahead and, and uh, stop my video. So anyways, thank you for joining tonight. And we, I love this topic. It is a topic of passion for me, customer service, customer loyalty. How do you build it? How important it is? What are the strategies for really developing um, extraordinary customer service in the eyes from your customers. And typically this is one that I do for the hospitality field, which is in uh, restaurants, small retailers. Um, then it bleeds over into tourism um, organizations, uh, tourism businesses, but then also for service-based businesses. And usually when I'm doing this type, this particular workshop, it's in person. So we um, talk a lot about different scenarios. So as I'm moving through this workshop, it is going to be focused a lot about customer loyalty, customer service in what we're experiencing now. 
um, what we've experienced in the last 12 weeks to what we may see in the upcoming months and how we can kind of look at customer service from a more um, virtual as well as in-person experiences with a lot of the new guidelines and social distancing and then with the human psychic of being prepared to come out and actually visit businesses. So it'll be a little different than what I typically talk about if we were pre-COVID-19, but um, there'll be an opportunity down the road in the next year for me to actually do that other, that other workshop more focused about uh, customer loyalty in the aspects of when you are actually able to go to people's house and meet them, have them come to your storefront and et cetera. So tonight I'm gonna to give an overview of customer service, loyalty, and the types of customers because types of customers, their behavior, um, they're, we're not profiling them. I'm just kind of talking about actually six different types of customers because I've added a sixth one for this workshop and kind of um, who are they, which ones are the ones that you really want to nurture and build into those loyal, profitable customers that really support you, um, appreciate your business, refer your business, and why they are those customers. And then what has been the impact of COVID-19 on the customer experience and behavior, which then relates to how we are looking at customer service through the uh, lens of where we are today, and then some strategies for really fostering customer loyalty in a changing marketplace. So in a changing marketplace, I didn't wanna just kind of keep talking about the pandemic and COVID-19, because it seems like that is what it, we're all doing all the time. And kind of in the changing marketplace with it being maybe new, uh, generations coming into the marketplace that will have new needs for your services and products from businesses, whether that's Gen Generation Z or the Millennials. And then also changing marketplace can be uh, actual maybe fluctuation in the season or an unusual uh, cold winter with a lot of weather and or like out here in Arizona where I live or where I have my second home and I'm kind of anchored here right now, we have the monsoon season hitting us, which was these flash floods. So that can be a changing marketplace too. And then we'll do a wrap up with questions. So what is customer loyalty? Um, and you're gonna, by the way, not only uh, have this recording, but I will send, um, uh, Linda's gonna then uh, give this to our office assistant and she will then send this along with my PowerPoint deck with the recording so you don't have to write all this down you'll get my slides as a follow through um, with the recording so customer loyalty is really that emotional bonding between a business and organization and its customers um, loyal customers favor one brand or shop or service over others they buy products frequently they spread good word and they generate leads. So your loyal customers are really those that are generating pretty much 80% of your revenue. Um, these are the ones that um, if you were uh, talking to your friends and you say, hey, I need a carpet cleaner, can you recommend anyone? Or I'm looking for a really good bookkeeper to help me to take all of my receipts out of my shoebox and help me organize them. Could you recommend one? And those will, um, the recommendations usually come from your, the loyal customers that that business has, has built. Um, so loyal customers really do seek out and favor their favorite shops or businesses for a lot of different reasons, whether it was the policies, the return policies, whether it was the quality of the work completed, whether it, it fit their, you know, times, they, uh, the business made extra uh, con, um, conditions for the business, for the customer. Um, I know a lot of times when I'm talking to communities and they're going through a major construction project and everything's really disrupted, we talk to businesses about really extending um, the service. And right now with pandemic, the curbside delivery, the free shipping, all of those are customer services. And those are really being offered. And you can really see who the loyal customers are of your business by who's 
taking advantage of that and who is financially supporting our small business community. And then customer service loyalty exists when a customer chooses to do business with a company, even if um, the product is less expensive, more convenient, or higher quality alternative is available somewhere else. And that's by the National Business Institute, Research Institute. Not something I made up, but I would say it anyways. <laughs> so what are the benefits of customer loyalty? Um, well, first of all, it's repeat business, and especially in our service-based businesses um, and our retail, and really across all businesses, even for myself as a consultant that typically contracts out with municipalities or state agencies or nonprofits, I'm really dependent on that repeat business, that word of mouth business, um, them coming back in two or three years and rehiring me because I did they're loyal, um, they were happy with the services I provided, um, and they're coming back. So that repeat business, which is so key for all of our business sectors. Um, it's, it also provides cross and upselling opportunities. When you're uh, really happy with a, a business and the products and services that they are um, offering you, there's an easier way, there's an easier ability with your loyal customers to upsell. Um, customers feel confident that you're, you're creating uh, trust with them. And then when you wanting to upsell them to uh, either a maybe different brand or an insurance uh, warranty, um, they are a, uh, more apt if you provided really loyal customer service to then feel that they would want to purchase that from you. Um, it reduces your marketing costs over and over and over again. When I am working with clients, I'll often ask them, well, tell me the top three ways that you, know, you build customer base. How do you reach your customers? Is it your social media platform? Is it your website? Is it your advertising? Is it your networking? And they always say, well, you know, word of mouth. And so word of mouth, which doesn't cost anything, um, that it automatically, if you have a strong reputation in the marketplace, you provide the products and services that you say you're going to, your customer service is extraordinary, then the word of mouth does generate. And that will lower your marketing costs. And then it helps you stand tall among competitors. Um, the one thing that we always are talking about with our small business owners um, in maybe um, a larger competitive market is what can you do to really do it, uh, make yourself different from the competitors uh, and compete in this like competitive marketplace? And when it is about the service that you provide, that extra mile or that extra uh, free wrapping or delivery that you uh, do at no charge. So it helps you stand tall among the competitors. And I think I mentioned this before that 80% of your revenue is really comes from 20% of your existing customers. And I always like to throw in this little caveat when I'm doing talking about marketing is that for every, takes 80 cents of your marketing efforts to generate a new customer, but it only takes cost you, can only cost you 20% or 20 cents of everything you do in marketing to retain and nurture a loyal customer. So customer service uh, equals customer loyalty. And they're kind of interchangeable. Customer service is how we do it and customer loyalty is kind of the outcome. So it really is your ability to supply your customers' wants and needs. A business's ability to satisfy its customers. Only satisfied customers have the potential to become loyal customers. And it gets harder and harder to look at what is that baseline or definition of a satisfied customer. Is it that they get their product on time? Is it that it's uh, packaged correctly? Is it that there's no errors in the service? Um, is it that they don't have to come back and fix what they did? Um, my poor mother, um, who's 87, lives on her own in Visalia. 
And she, uh, when my father passed away last September, she put everything in her name, right? In January when she moved to her new apartment. Well, for some reason it didn't go right. And her internet bill, her payment was going to my dad's account and then they were threatening to shut it off. So she had to open up a new account and then the, her internet didn't work. And so, you know, she was very frustrated um, because she was not a satisfied customer and she was really bad mouthing the internet uh, provider. And I said, well, mom, give them a call. Um, they may make a house call right now. They are um, an essential business. If you feel comfortable to have them come out, um, you know, you can't go to them, but maybe they can come and help um, walk you through that. So give them, the, um, them a call before you become so frustrated and change services. And that's what she did. Um, is she a satisfied customer now? Yes, she is. She's still kind of maybe unsatisfied with why did they apply that bill, that uh, payment to that one account that was closed. So they did everything they possibly could to retain her and make sure she's satisfied because, you know, people if we had a bad experience but only maybe three people if it was fabulous experience so she is now a satisfied customer and I'm thinking their service provider is probably wanting to make sure that she continues to be loyal um, excellent customer service is the ability of an organization or your business to consistently and constantly exceed the customers expectations and expectations are not something that are tangible. Um, they're usually something we develop over time from knowing our customers, from talking with them, from listening to them, from their reviews they give you, from checking in with them periodically with a survey or picking up the phone and calling them and saying, hey, how was everything? Did it meet your expectation? Is there anything else we can do for you? So those type of actions from a business, then you can learn not only what are the expectations of the customer, but then you can also help take that customer from just being satisfied to being loyal because you're going up and beyond what their expectations are. And then fueled by the rise of online shopping, hmm, as I think I had this statement prior to COVID-19, obviously today's consumers have more purchasing options than ever before. And um, with uh, being closed, really online surge is one of the impacts that we're seeing from the pandemic. So the onus is really now on the brands to connect with their consumers how they want it, when they want it, with what they want, thus providing them with the experience these, they desire. So we're becoming more of a connected, quote unquote, type of consumer base. And then how we deliver that virtually is going to be key in the coming years in terms of delivering um, extraordinary customer service virtually. So um, why is it important? I just kind of talked a little bit about that because it is customer service is the primary driver of customer loyalty. Good customer service saves small businesses money, especially on returns, taking back a product. Today, um, I had to call. I do very little online shopping. I am one of your most loyal in-person small business shopper there is, but because I have to shop sometimes um, online now because of the inability to get the products and services that I want because we're not open, um, I ordered my monthly um, cleaning products that I order from a company that is all natural. And um, I've been tracking the delivery and it wasn't here this morning. So I went on and looked and they said, UPS said they had delivered it last night at 720. Well, you know, I walked around my house. I looked for that box, nowhere to be seen. So I sat down to kind of figure it out. Where's my product? Where's my box? And of course, with everything being uh, delivered now, um, 
uh, from to our houses, there's a lot of chatter out there about, oh, you better check your boxes. Somebody might take them. So I started to call UPS. Well, you can't call UPS. You can only go online. So then I went and called my company that I ordered my cleaning products for. And she goes, um, and I got a live body right away. They pick up the phone. Um, excellent call service. And she's, you know, basically said, well, I don't know why, but I'll just tell me, um, I'll just send you out a new order today. I said, oh, well, what happens if I find my other order? And she says, not a problem. You just keep it or let us know. Not, we won't charge you twice. And I said, oh, really? And then I'm like, oh, well, I don't know if I want to do that. I'm feeling kind of guilty. So long story short, I waited a day. Well, my neighbor comes walking over just about an hour ago and they, you know, UPS delivered it to the wrong house. We had it. However, am I a satisfied customer? Is it saving that business that would have sent it out another whole $90 order at no charge to me? Yes. So it works on a lot of different levels. Um, and not saying that you're always going to have to do give away the, the shop, but you, you, know, you do look at those ways that you can uh, satisfy the pain that the customer is feeling. Um, you cannot, it is absolutely true across all sectors that small businesses um, any business, but a small business cannot survive long term on bad press. And bad press can be just us talking with our friends to as well as a post, um, a rant on, unfortunately, on social media, a bad review on a review site, um, just even some uh, larger businesses getting bad press in um, just in traditional publications, whether that's online news and digital marketing or online news or in, in print, out in print. So we just have to be very, you know, we cannot survive on any um, long-term bad press. And it, then it's really kind of inflating to us as businesses. We have to go ahead back and we have to, to uh, deal with the situation, resolve it. Um, and, and sometimes people just create it because they just are that way. And it's not anything we did as a small business. It's just the nature of dealing with human beings in a business and consumer based um, environment. Um, and then it does, like I said, uh, in a lot of ways, businesses can compete with larger corporate businesses. Now, this little cartoon um, uh, is something that I just sound so cute. It says someone's calling themselves a customer says they want something called service. So I just kind of put that on there for a, a placeholder. So what are the, the, the five types of customers? Um, and you will see this if you Google types of customers. They go from five to six. They call them all different things. So I added my own sixth one to this presentation. And you'll see what it is when I get to the sixth one. So the first customer, which is the cream of the crop, this is your loyal customer. And typically, they represent no more than 20% of your base, but make up 50% of your sales. So when I'm talking to customer uh, to clients about how do you um, how are you reaching your customer base? Who is it that you're trying to target? And during a very lean times or during a crisis like we're experienced, get to know who that 20% of your base is. They are the most loyal. You should communicate with them regularly by telephone, mail, email, social media. Um, these become your, an amb your ambassadors for your business. They're the ones that give you the word of mouth. They're the ones that will come in and support you and um, over and over and are satisfied, loyal customers. These are the ones that can and should influence your, your buying and merchandise decisions because these are the business, these are the customers. The loyal customer is the one that regularly shops with you, um, hires you, um, and recommends you. Um, so sometimes when we are doing market research, I'll suggest to a business to pull together a focus group. If they're not sure that the product is going to meet the pleasure of the market out there, pull together a focus group and ask them, I'm thinking of changing this or adding this, or would this be something you would um, uh, find a value to your lifestyle if we added this extra service? Um, so anyways, nothing can, will make a loyal customer feel better than you 
soliciting their input and showing how much you value it. And then you can never do enough for them. Positive word of mouth is gold for business. So people buy from people they trust. It's just the nature of who we are and how we are designed. So your loyal customers are the first type that um, you really want to nurture and, and use both for spreading a uh, good word about your business, referring people, but also, um, also, uh, I'm sorry, my phone is buzzing. Also gathering data from them, gather, gathering input. Second is the discount customer. Now I have a girlfriend, she is the discount shopper up one side, down in the other. She doesn't go out shopping unless there's a discount. Um, they shop your store frequently, but make their decisions based on the size of the markdowns. My friend will wait for that semi-annual clothing sale that the small retailer has, and then she will go down and try everything on, and unless it's discounted enough by 60%, she won't purchase anything. But she will tell you, she will let you know if she likes something, she does say good, you know, she is positive, she will talk about the great sale. This category helps you ensure your inventory is turning over, and as a result, it is a key contributor to your cash flow. Um, I know that when I'm gonna be working with retailers, we're gonna be talking about how to move inventory that's been sitting on the shelves. Um, if we've already missed a season, or we aren't having as many visitors coming to our tourist-based economy, and so those uh, souvenir items or those trinkets or those trend items that we purchased aren't gonna be moving, how are we going to move them? How are we going to get them off our shelves so we can create some cash flow? And actually, we're just gonna be looking at how to create cash flow once we open up our businesses. Um, and we've been looking at how to create cash flow virtually, offering discounts. If you look at any online shop they're offering lots of deep discounts. The discount uh, type of customer is the same group that will wind up costing you money because they are more inclined to return the product. Ugh. And then discount shoppers are not always easily turned into loyal customers either. Um, so that's the discount uh, customer. The impulse count, um, type of customer is they do not have to buy a particular item at the top of their list, but they come into your, but come into your store on a whim. This is the type of customer that, we'll, that we are likely to, we like to serve. Nothing's more exciting than assisting an impulse shop, shopper to respond to your recommendations and purchase that. Um, it is recommended in some of the research that I did that you should target your displays towards this group. What's that new shiny you know, ball right there? What's that new shiny product? What's that new shiny service that you're providing right across the banner of your website for an impulse purchase? Um, and they are also eager to make a purchase when nudged in the right direction. Um, so, you know, I, I'm not an impulse buyer anymore, probably was more back when I you know, was a little bit younger and had more discretionary, probably back before I, we had put three kids through college and had more discretionary income to spend. A lot of times um, impulse buying, you'll find that when you're traveling or you're uh, maybe out uh, for a restaurant, you're going to try a higher uh, level restaurant because you're on vacation. Um, and then you'll buy that t-shirt that you wouldn't normally buy from a restaurant because it has some kind of connection. And the customer service um, brand, the customer service experience was really one that you want to create memories around. Need-based, they have a specific intention to buy a particular type of item driven by a specific need. They buy for a variety of reasons, like a specific occasion, a specific need or price point. I think we're seeing more need-based as a result of the impact that the pandemic's had on a lot of our incomes. Uh, customers in, you know, either being uh, reduced hours, uh, uh, some are you know, being laid off, um, so we're becoming much more need-based. I'm telling you, I don't think I'm going to be needing to buy any new clothes for a while because I have hardly touched my closet full of clothes. 
Because <laughs> when you're working virtually, you know, you guys see me from the waist up. So anyways, and, and so that need-based is more, um, it's probably, if pre-COVID, it would be more of those large purchased items or a specific dress for a wedding. Um, those are the need-based type of customers. Um, important to remember, it can easily be lost to internet sales or a different retailer. To overcome this threat, we positive personal uh, interaction is required, and usually one from one of your top salespeople. Need-based, if they purchased something and they took a while and they came in and they've already re researched it virtually or online, they're coming into your um, place of business, they're comparing prices, you really have to kind of work to get them to actually purchase it from you. And then there may be some extra care, but they may be one of the customers that you can turn into loyal. And maybe if it's a huge, um, uh, um, account that they will be ones that you will ask for a referral. They may be the ones that you ask for a review. Um, and then the wanderer. These are the folks that no specific, and we don't have too many wanderers right now out in our communities. Um, but these are often the ones that come into the store. They just want to kind of experience the community of uh, your, your shop. Um, there's, uh, they could be a largest segment of terms of traffic, but the smallest in terms of sales. Sometimes we see this in our tourism based economies where we have a lot of folks coming in, visiting, maybe they went to get something to bite to eat. They're wandering through the store, seeing what's um, in our tourist based uh, communities, but they're not really buying. Um, they're not ready to purchase um, something from your uh, retail store or your gift shop. Um, so they're just wandering around. They are important to remember they not represent a significant amount of your immediate sales, but they can be a real voice for your community, especially if they're popping in, seeing what's going on. Um, you know, how do you greet them? Do you let them, you know, kind of wander around without purchasing? Um, and then they're merely looking for interaction. They are also very likely to tell others about their experience. And then I added this one. This is the stressed or anxious customer. And we're going to be seeing a little bit more of this just because of the pandemic. Stress customers are psychologi uh, psychologically less open to new ideas or products or services and far more critical of things. I just met a girlfriend for a glass of wine yesterday because our restaurants have opened and haven't been out since March. She's a very dear friend, colleague. So we met and, you know, we both walked in. I wasn't anxious, but I did ask the question, do I need to wear a mask? Um, all the waiters and waitresses had masks on. They reconfigured the, the bar with two stools together and then six feet apart. Um, and so, you know, before I would just walk in, what's going on? What's the menu? But I was really much more observant of of how they're navigating um, service, customer service was fabulous. Now they all had masks on. I could hear them regularly. Their eyes were shining with happiness. They were truly attentive. Saw a few folks um, and then the restaurant slowly filled up, but it still was, you know, psychologically, I could see, you know, there was a little bit of stress or anxiousness among a few people. Um, anxious customers will be looking for brands to add to their lives and experiences, but looking to uh, see how you might help them keep what they have. Looking for energy, comfort, time, confidence, control, and not lose any more of that. We're very anxious right now. Customers are very anxious with uh, going into stores. How are they um, cleaning it. What's the sanitation? If you're going to a client's place of business, uh, um, home, uh, service-based businesses have really been hit hard. The ones that offer home services like HVAC users, re plumbers, electricians that are repairing things. I'm sure my mother was very anxious having the internet provider come over. And so we're really having to work and communicate that in all of our um, communication pieces 
with our customers, whether that's on our website, whether that's verbally when we pick up the phone and make the appointment, whether that is so on our social media platform, our emails, we're really having to help talk about what we're doing to protect our workforce and protect our customers. So anxious. And then in time of crisis, worried customers become even more unduly influenced by the wider social response. So we are not um, really looking at um, the best uh, thing that's going to, you know, make your life and um, your home better. We're not looking at the, the whole advertising and platforms, the, the corporate advertising platforms, they're all about um, passion, uh, compassion. Um, we feel we are here with you. Um, you know, there's, you're seeing lots of switches over, not just purchase this car, but how this car is really sensitive to where we're at right now with the pandemic and we'll deliver the car to you and it'll be fully sanitized so it'll protect your family so we're anxious we're stressed um if it wasn't the pandemic it could have been something else but this has really elevated this type of customer um to you know standards that are going to be around for a while so i'm going to take a breath and take a drink of water I'm not sure I have any questions in the chat box there. Um, you can, if you have any questions, feel free to, to type them in that chat box. It's over there uh, floating around. If you don't see it on your bar, um, it's on the three dots. Other than that, whoops, I'm sorry. I hate when this happens. I pushed the wrong button. So anyways, what has been the impact of COVID-19? You probably already know all of this because we have lived with this for over um, almost 12 weeks. Um, I stopped counting when it first came out, when we were first uh, stay at home order came out and sheltered in place. I kept asking my husband, well, how long do you think this will last? And he kept saying two weeks. So it's been longer than two weeks, but um, let's see, I think I have it. I think I went the wrong way. Let me just go backwards. Yes, there we go. So first of all, it's greatly impacting our consumers' shopping behavior and purchase decisions. And I kind of talked a little bit about that. But according to a recent First Insight study, um, nearly one third of consumers are taking advantage of the buy online, pick up in store service to get their products delivered, right? Without going in the store. Well, we can't go in the store. Um, and so the curbside, the subscriptions, the auto ships are all starting to really see a bump in, um, in the amount of customers that are using those customer services. And that's what I like to call them because prior to COVID-19, a lot of those were just add-on services or abilities to receive your product or service um, ability to interface with your favorite businesses. We could always hop in the car and go down and walk in, or we could just call and make an appointment and we'd meet them for coffee, or we'd meet them at a, play, a workspace place. And so those um, with COVID-19 has really uh, been put on the back burner and all of these other ways that we can get our services and products has really taken the front seat. So. Consumers are still going to need products and services, um, and this is really going to continue to change our behaviors. All stores and businesses are going to have to look at continuing these type of customer services. Maybe they weren't fully developed prior to COVID-19, especially our social commerce or e-commerce sites for our smaller retailer businesses. Um, restaurants are continuing. Um, the restaurant I went to yesterday, that is a sit-down restaurant, still I, does curbside, is still doing delivery, is still using one of the third-party programs to deliver their uh, food out. And this is going to continue um, as we try to build that uh, that confidence back into our consumer base and be less anxious of the pandemic. And we don't know when that will be. 
Um, we don't know if that'll be tomorrow or it'll be, um, it, you know, I heard today that if people feel a third of our consumer base will just feel okay to go back when everything is opened up eventually or are already going back and, and supporting businesses that are have the ability to reopen with the new guidelines. A third are going to kind of maybe dip their toe in it and then a third are going to wait until there's a vaccine. So what we have is kind of looking at your customer services and saying if this is true then I better look at developing my services on all three of those platforms. So shifts, uh, customer service volume has shifted. Businesses have actually shifted their customer service policies and teams to seasonal changes in their incoming seasonal uh, support um, volume. We've always done that. We've always kind of shifted, especially in our tourism-based businesses, we've uh, shifted the customer service volume. Um, with the pandemic, um, uh, they're creating bigger, uh, huge changes um, at a much greater scale and with, of course, less warning. We did, we did not have the time to slowly change our services as we saw our season change or we saw um, a maybe a smaller type of uh, disaster happen. I don't like to say that, but with the COVID-19, obviously, um, it is not our fault. It happened overnight. We didn't do anything wrong, but we as businesses had to immediately shift our customer service. We saw and we have kicked into exploring new ways to reach our customer through our customer services. The industry seeing big drops in support volume. Um, this little graph here is about the home services, which would be those type that come to your home, whether it's the internet provider or the plumber coming in to fix the drain, or um, you know, you're getting a new HVAC and they're coming in to do an estimate. So you know, immediately um, that home service-based business was at its peak in March um, because that's its uh, its its prime time and then and, you know that drop was just dr dramatic it's a cliff drop uh, same with my consulting business as my business um, and one day had you know a nice year of the contracts was looking at it was going to be a really profitable year and then in a matter of a week not at all contracts cut canceled um, or shifted or postponed until 2021. Some are wait and see. Um, those wait and sees keep getting pushed back. And so it makes it really hard for a business to uh, look at, well, do I go out and try to get a, a, a foster new uh, customers or do I get a day job to balance what I maybe have lost in my small business to just help me pay my personal um, Fees. So that pivoting, that's the new term, how we're pivoting is really a lot of the industries have, uh, have really the impact has been severe. While on the other flip side, if you were a grocery store or you were a um, uh, exercise routine, if you were a fitness uh, equipment, or I heard today, if you were a bike shop, you may be seeing a huge demand in your product or service, and you can't keep up with it because maybe you can't get enough products in to fulfill the orders. So the impact of COVID can also of COVID nineteen can also see big demand in, in support volume. We're, we saw that a lot in home improvement retail, online retailers of, of household goods home hardware, gardening supplies, line around, you know, Home Depot, because um, they were there for a while and only allowing so many in and being an essential business, a lot of folks were doing the, you know, home at home projects because they had maybe more time. We saw a real big bump in work and education. I mean, Zoom, you know, just broke all records. And we're an example of who's supporting that demand with them video providers and e-learning technology companies saw an unprecedented jump in their uh, demand for support through May, uh, March and April, and that was because all the schools had to go uh, virtual. 
home cooking, believe it or not, is be, has become a industry that has seen a spike in big demand. So um, if you, you know, we're in those areas, um, there could be um, so a lot of demand for that. However, with the shelter and home and finding some a quality workforce and training up and then improving your services to meet that has been hard for a lot of those businesses that are seeing this demand and it's impacting the satisfaction of the customer that reflects back into customer service. Um, it's putting pressure on resources for managing the queries, uh, the impact of COVID-19, especially if you are a demand business. Unusual patterns in your business cycles. You're experiencing unusual patterns, which means hotel booking companies, for example, have been through uh, immensely busy, busy periods of cancellations and rescheduling. Uh, and they are operating with a very, very lean, thin staff. And so they can't respond to every phone call. They're even like UPS taking off the phone. And or if you do actually get the 800 number, you can Google it and still find it. They have a recording that at this time due to COVID-19, we're not taking phone calls. Did that make me happy? Did I feel like that was good customer service? No, because of my immediate need needed to be fulfilled. The, my issue, ha, you know, where's my box? <laughs> so, you know, it wasn't very uh, satisfying, satisfaction. So I had to go to, you know, actually call directly, which I didn't think they could do anything about it because they were depending on UPS to ship it out, but they did. Um, you know, so, and then after you, they're going to, uh, with the hotel, for example, rescheduling, cancellations, and then it's really quiet. I mean, you know, we're seeing that across all of the travel industry. Um, so some service providers will have seen the retail element of their customer base dwindle, but then seeing maybe a spike in handling a huge growth in the healthcare sector of their customer base. Um, so these are um, really uh, challenging uh, conditions to be navigating because they aren't planned. We don't know how to react to them. They weren't scheduled. And then on top of everything else, our workforce is, is, um, is limited. Uh, we're just seeing these unusual patterns and th this has been the impact. Scaling up the emotional energy needed to work effectively during the global crisis. So behind those numbers um, are real people. Behind every business trying to deliver curbside, get an online store going, to, um, have you come back in their restaurant, there's real people behind those, both those as customers and those who serve them. So support tools and systems and even staffing have to be scaled up or down. But it's much harder to scale up when the emotional energy needed to work efficiently during a global crisis. And we're seeing this um, with some of our workforce not wanting to come back yet, or they got another job. Um, so it's been a very emotional roller coaster for our small businesses on top of being shut and then the gradual guideline, the, uh, trying to put in the guidelines and the changes to open. And then the emotional effort of helping highly stressed and anxious customers while dealing with their own change situations. It can take a toll on your team. Um, you know, customers are providing less data with their conversations. It means it takes more touch points per conversation to get the information from them to really help them um, and keep them. People are working from home without the practice or setup to do it well. And then with their kids suddenly nearby all day, if I mean, and we're all really lenient when we're doing our team calls about working from home, knowing that, you know, your husband may be in the other room or your kids or your pets are in the house. Um, but this is all kind of, you know, the emotional energy it takes and then just learning the new technology has been an emotional tech, um, uh, uh, drain on us you should all be trying to build trust 
to listen well and to be more flexible than we uh, might usually be because they're still we still have a long ways to go and the new normal, which I hate to use that term, but it really is more virtual. And these are for different generations, more frustrating um, or not. So the new ways to address look, don't touch. This was interesting because I was kind of like thinking about uh, customer service in terms of our retail. And we've always, you know, talked about greeting the, the customer, asking them questions, what they're looking for, helping them pick out an outfit or find that gift, taking it to their dressing room. Well, all of this is going to be changing for the short term. Um, as people return to stores, there may be the ways of picking up their merchandise that they come in contact with others, like pushing shopping carts, punching the buttons on credit card readers. Um, you know, uh, a lot of stores are starting to open and they're going to be holding the merchandise for the customer. Uh, they're going to it's going to hold the merchandise that customers try on, for example, Macy's, in um, in fit fitting rooms for 24 hours before returning them to the racks. So, when you see that, that rack that has all those clothes on that people have tried on, it's gonna sit there for 24 hours, evidently to be sanitized before it goes back on the racks. And um, so, you know, hand there's gonna be a mandate that we use hand sanitizer before we try on jewelry or watches. And then uh, just to start with the impact on gift wrapping, um, and return policies is going to be a huge one. I know that a lot of businesses um, right now are not letting you return items that you buy online. So thinking all of those, because those are all the services that create uh, loyal customers. The shop local movement. Love this one. Finally, it's cool to shop local. So the pandemic has instilled in many customers a greater interest in supporting local. Um, a lot of it's because we just couldn't leave our house to travel down the hill or over the hill to go to the big box, to then per go out to dinner, then go to a movie. So, you know, really when we were closer to home and we, had, uh, we were sheltered in place, our local community became now suddenly very important. And then we were really working hard to support local. Um, so, you know, your favorite coffee shops and breweries so they don't go out of business. Um, so many shoppers will continue to look, shop local um, and even after um, COVID-19. And because I think that they took the mom and pop for granted. Now, does that mean you get lax on really extraordinary customer service? No, because people are fickle. We're very fickle. And once we get more comfortable, back to life as we knew it, um, we'll go back and we'll look for ease of convenience or price points. But I do think that the uh, shop local, eat local, spend local, enjoy local mindset will stay with us for a while and we'll think twice about going and supporting one of our local businesses who's made up of individuals that make up our community, that pay taxes, that provide our, our services for us at a, a municipality level. Because we're going to see that from our municipalities. No sales tax lower services. Parks have been closed. They're working really hard to try to figure out how to keep personnel going when there's, they can't have entry fees or the pool isn't open to charge or they can't do swimming lessons. So all of it's going to be a ripple, a ripple effect. Everything goes virtual. This pandemic has really, like I said earlier, accelerated the rate of people meeting, learning, exercising, and even dating virtually. I don't know. Um, that's always been there, but uh, you know, even more. Uh, we're, we're living on our screens. We're living in real time, whether it's um, with uh, uh, Zoom or whether it's with uh, FaceTime. Um, you know, I haven't seen my granddaughter. She is 16. Uh, she doesn't always want to talk to her her go go, but you know, FaceTime has become the way that I can actually see her in real time, and it's been really important. So retailers are going to need to get creative as consumers become much more comfortable with buying things on the internet. Um, they need to find better ways to showcase inventory online and to make sure shoppers know what size clothes are and shoes are to buy. 
Um, and these are for retailers primarily. Um, and you you know, com companies will need to offer more experience. Um, like uh, you ever have uh, Warby and Par Parker is a, uh, they sell, they sell eye frames or glass frames and they send you five eye um, frames, glass frames um, to try on. And then you send them back, they give you the box, the label and everything. And then you send them back. If you don't like those five, send out five more. If you pick one you like, you tell them what it is, you send over your eye prescription and then it's you know sent to you in, in the mail. You don't even have to go into have any glass, eyeglasses. You don't have to go into any shops. Just have to get your eye prescription. So my daughter, my 24 year old, taught me that one three years ago. That's how she bought her first you know, pair of eyeglasses when she needed them. Um, and that's what they do. So we're, everything going virtually. Um, I know, Erin, you said that you were a freelance bookkeeper. I'm sure you're doing a lot online, uh, whether you're using QuickBooks or another um, uh, platform. But you know, a lot of that is done online already. And, um, but maybe you meet with them uh, quarterly in person to uh, go over things with them. And that interface is really important too. So, you know, we're gonna continue to want to do that. Um, but the impact of COVID-19 is really shifting um, virtual to becoming more of an everyday occurrence in our shopping experiences and in our customer uh, service. And then customers are more loyal to brands that provide confidence. And that's always been, that's what we all strive for, shops, businesses, to be, um, uh, you know, help our customers know that we know what we're doing, we're providing excellent service, we buy products and services they want, they like, we back our products and services, we provide the extra, we go the extra mile, provide added value, all of those are um, what build loyal customers. So enough of the impact, let's talk about how we can uh, navigate some strategies for fostering customer loyalty in this very unusual, ever-changing marketplace. Well, I know if you've gone plugged into any uh, trainings or webinars or are working with an advisor in your, uh, for your business, or you're listening to you know, reading blogs or watching um, any uh, reading social media, in your industry, you got to have a plan. You've got to have a plan. It's forced all of us, both as business owners, consumers, customers, vendors, employers, into new ways of operating. And as a result of business for businesses, forced us to plan. <laughs> Whether we're not essential or essential. And as entrepreneurs, we plan in our head, but we don't really write it out write it down unless we have to present it to a capital uh, for funding for capital or, you know, we're like me, I do it for a living, strategic planning, and I have to produce a plan and I give it to a client and whether they look at it or not is, you know, I never know. But for us as small businesses and with limited resources and with a dip in our um, revenue uh, streams, we really have to look at what is our uh, contingency plan. Uh, for the short term, how to drive revenue, applying for funding, shifting our operations and workforce, and now is reopening, adjusting and communicating new guidelines. All of these have forced us by default to develop a contingency plan, or I like to call it a two, uh, three month, six month, one year action plan. What's the impact on our customer service, our delivery channels? workforce training. So, you know, if you have a lot of uh, great customer services all real, already built into your business model and they've been kind of on hold or you want to look at how to pivot them, th you know, this is what we're talking about planning. Um, if you are uh, already virtually set up, but you still want to maybe um, have uh, you know a in-person relationship with your customers? How will that look? Where will you you know how how will you invite them into your office again? A lot of offices are really uh, uh, looking at pivoting, uh, building in that confidence with how they're cleaning. Um, the pexi glass. My husband's a picture framer, 
can't get any plexiglass for his picture frames because everybody's ordering it. There is a, there is so much uh, demand that there isn't enough supply. And so, you know, again, an impact of COVID-19. So developing your plan, your short-term plan, um, you know, looking at one goal, achieving it, moving to the next one, what do you act absolutely have to do to maintain a cash flow? And what can you give up and put on the back burner? And as business advisors for your small business development center, we're there to help you with that. Um, focus on listening. And we are, um, customers will be more stressed at type six, stressed and anxious customer, and may be under pressure outside of their interaction with your business. Life is difficult for a lot of us. And um, so you have more time. You can spend uh, more time maybe being a, coming a good listener, allowing people to have at least one calm, helpful conversation during their day. Your good listening maybe, um, um, maybe in how you're posting on your social media. Uh, you know, we're here, we're listening to our, your concerns. Here are the changes we're making in our business. Maybe it's a quote. Um, so, and then when you pick up the phone to address an issue, because like my mom, she would be your classic example of getting her on the other end of having to be a good listener, patient. Um, I know uh, when I talk about some of my, uh, if you have ever had experienced uh, getting medical bills and you are getting the bills from the doctor and then you got to talk to the insurance agent, you know, bless their hearts, those insurance call center folks. They're so patient they are, and compassionate, talk you off the cliff, tell you, okay, well, here's, let's go through line by line, really listening on the end and then knowing your frustration level trying to calm you down. So that feeds into work on your knowledge base to provide exceptional service for the digital world. Look at, you know, the term uh, knowledge base typically refers to the information stored in a system, but it can also um, be the software using to author or present that information. Your knowledge base can compose, comprise uh, many forms of content, including FAQs. Every website I see that I go to under the customer service uh, tab has FAQs. Um, FAQs help us kind of read on our time and try to find our question answered. For UPS, they actually had like a, a vetted system, and that's UPS. They've invested, you know, they have a lot of money, and or they do, and they're worldwide, you know. What's your, what question do you have? What's your issue? Well, my box didn't come. And then there was like three drop down questions they asked you and you linked on that and it sent you to another one. So sometimes just for our small businesses, FAQ, um, you know, what's your return policy? What are my, our hours? Are you, um, are you open? Um, so, you know, those FAQs are very important and they can sit on your website, which is your landing page. You can push them out through your social media platforms. You can also include them in your email marketing. You can have them, you know, um, and then they also help you train your workforce who then in person will be interfacing with the customer and they have the, the, the training and the knowledge of what some of your services are. Review your processes and workflows. When you're just keeping up, you don't have time to consider whether there's a more effective way to do something. With a little bit of lag time, perhaps now you could look at a more effective or efficient way to do something and or is there um, a way of doing it that makes more sense. Use some of these quiet periods to rethink your approach and implement new procedures. This will be key as you bring back your workforce. Training processes, new policies, collecting information, and customers to add to your digital marketing processes. You're going to be needing to really look at this and um, depending on what type of business you are, your processes, how have they changed? Um, uh, and will it be a permanent change? Is it a temporary change if you're changing your hours or you're changing how you deliver the product or service? Um, 
you know, all of this is going to need to be communicated to your customers and then instilled in your work workforce because your workforce, your frontline folks who interface with your customers, whether it's on the phone or it's in person, is a direct reflection of your customer service. And nothing is worse than having employees who don't know what to do, don't have the ability or the flexibility to make a quick decision, haven't been trained. Um, and so in my normal customer service workshop, I really talk a lot about that training period and how you train, the importance of training your employees, hiring right. I'm leaving that out in this one because it's just not relevant right now. Um, invest in quick digital to stay connected. Um, connection is what we're all about right now. If you need to pull back funds, do it someplace else in your business, but not in your digital services, um, as these are going to be and will be continue to be your lifeline through this crisis, um, as well as a long time in uh, term investment for to help your business stand out. Um, I unfortunately think it's changing the baseline of our small retail uh, shops and some of maybe our um, uh, sit down restaurants that people are going to expect e-commerce they're going to expect delivery as a normal service you provide um, so now's the time to look at e-commerce or social commerce and or curbside delivery, and you don't have to put every product and service on your e-commerce site, but really quick digital is where you want to be able to invest in. Um, mobile ordering will continue to surge, um, and uh, the changing customer expectations and behaviors will require brands to find new ways to interact with their customers through the mobile ordering experience. Um, on the uh, Facebook has launched their shop and, and then since Facebook owns Instagram, you can shop on Instagram now. You do, it's um, not, you don't have to have Spotify. Um, you just have to be able to uh, be a business, have a business page, link it to your bank, and then you upload the products and services. It can sit on your website, it can link to your website, so they drives them to that place. So all of the motor mobile ordering is gonna be continue to grow. Businesses will need to go up and beyond for their customers and show them that they are there for them no matter what. Brands must increase their efforts to ensure the best customer service and experience is delivered in our changing marketplace. And a lot of that is going to be communicating how we're sanitizing and cleaning our businesses and, our, and protecting our workforce. Um, the time it takes for a product to be ordered, to be delivered to the customer, and the way that it is packaged is gonna be becoming more important. Um, being able to pick up um, like we have been at what you're seeing like in Walmart and Target where they people come out to the to the car to deliver um, grocery uh, delivery has taken a huge spike all of these that we're seeing in our larger businesses are going to be trickling down to our moms and pops to our, our more smaller businesses and then way into our service-based businesses so going up and um, up and beyond. Um, for example, uh, a restaurant uh, that I, my daughter said she was so pleasantly surprised that when she ordered the food and it was delivered from the restaurant, there was a little something extra. They had put in a free dessert. Just unexpected. Boy, and what a, what a treat, right? So she, uh, tells people that all the time and you could go this and they put in a you know a free dessert it wasn't anything that I had to do didn't have to show a coupon didn't have to order it on Tuesday by five to six to get it it just showed up unexpectedly and we always say that that is what true extraordinary customer service is is meeting customers expectations when they don't expect it right and then the human touch approach is still relevant 
um, shops are, and I and I'm talking about in person. Whether you're going to a, uh, a workspace to meet a client, or you're going into a small retail, or you're going to go to uh, a restaurant and you're going to sit down and enjoy that restaurant at the, them to serving you the food, cleaning up after you, not eating out of styrofoam or cardboard. So you know, there's going to be they they. At least this one uh, study that I was looking at for this workshop is that there's going to be an unprecedented surge of users and higher consumer expectations um, for of uh, uh, people coming back wanting that human touch. It's still relevant with the customer experience, and I'm not talk talking physical touch because right now that's a bad word, but I'm talking that in face, eye to eye in uh, human, you know, human to human interaction. Um, video interactions are still going to be important. Video, human assisted online shopping is going to be a, a growing. Co consultation through video calls. I'm sure we're gonna continue to be providing advising through Zoom. But, um, you know, again, that human touch, even if it is a screen, um, is still relevant in building that customer service. Customer communication. You're going to need to have a communication plan in place. Show that you care. Thinking all about everything that you create and curate are with more resources. You're going to be proactive in your communications. Offer a shoulder to lean on. Inspire your audience. All of this, there's a lot of depth I can go in each of these areas. But you really want to think about how you're communicating and staying in touch with your customers and then and then vert customer service and talking about your um, what you're doing to protect them so I really like this uh, Facebook page this is a, a business in Grass Valley for Hill Mercantile my friend owns it she's a large uh, uh, gift shop and toy store and up until two weeks ago she was not did not have an e-commerce site up until uh, March 17th she was not on Instagram and never did anything on her Facebook page but now because of the pandemic she is integrated and up put that up the very forefront and is actually using it to drive sales uh, and drive a lot of sales and then now that she's reopening she put that her reopening statement is her cover page on her Facebook, right there when you go to her Facebook page. And then they, she's done the same for her Instagram. And then of course, it's across the banner on her, her website, telling you when they're open, that they offer curbside and in-store service, send her a message for assistance, every possible way that it, she can help you purchase one of her products or services. So I thought that was, you know, using the social media platform, which many of us go to to check things out and stay connected and be social. That's why they call it social man, um, media. And then thinking about this and uh, just thinking and watching my daughter who's 24 who was doing, working as a, um, you know, she got sheltered in ho at home and she had to take all her calls. She works for a ticketing company and they you know when they first came out large festivals were being canceled and you know 300 calls or 300 emails a day to answer so i was watching her and and uh when she came over to the house one day to, to kind of work from home and you know thinking about the importance of your virtual customer service team um and and watching her use her company computer, they gave her a hotspot, so she had strong internet, she had a professional headpiece, she had, a, uh, obviously they trained her on what to say because she'd been doing this for a couple of years, so she's very comfortable with listening to the issue, and we're talking some very anxious customers, wanting to know if they get their ticket, you know, their $1,000 worth of tickets returned because the festival was canceled or postponed, and so, you know, really seeing that and, and knowing she was trained, she had the right equipment, there was a sense of um, self-discipline, 
created. Uh, and then she said that she was also rewarded that they had call in uh, Mon Mondays, they had team call ins, and she they went through the calls who had the who spent the most time with customers, but had the less referral to the higher management. And she was awarded, um, you know, a gift certificate for be, having the most positive uh, feedback. Um, yes, she had the longest calls. It took her longer than maybe some other folks, but none of her calls that week were sent up to management. So that means she solved the issues and they were satisfactory. So again, that virtual call service team is, the, is our virtual customer service. It is how people are now interfacing and will continue. And for a long time, for a lot of our insurance companies, a lot of our healthcare companies, for our, a lot of um, uh, internet providers, we've had call service teams dealing with our issues, but now we're seeing it bleed over into all uh, sectors. So make sure that you've got that uh, piece of your business because it will probably continue to be an important customer service part of building customer loyalty. And, sheesh, I do think I am done. So I'm gonna put my face back on the uh, uh, meeting and I think we just still have the three of us, right? So if Aaron wants, to, if you want to either um, talk, and I'm just going to let Linda take over because this is where she just is shines, okay. and uh, we'll go from there. Aaron, I can see you turned your mic on. So what questions do you have? How can Lonnie help you? Um, yeah, this is great, my personal webinar. Um, <laughs> and you know, we don't even charge for it. Isn't that the best? I'm even creating questions to ask on your behalf. This is good. <laughs> um, I took some notes and I'm just flipping through. I, I feel like for me, um, being a freelance bookkeeper and financial analyst, um, it, when you went through the five types of customers and of course the topic of the webinar being developing customer loyalty. It, it's all about customer loyalty for, for my business. Um, you know, because typically people don't hire a bookkeeper or someone to do financial an analysis on a one-off. Um, it's, it's a recurring kind of service. And, right. Um, you know, with, and so that coupled with kind of what we're experiencing now with the whole COVID-19 situation, um, it's become really critical, critically important. Um, I've realized that I not only keep the customers I've got, but as I build my business, um, increase customer loyalty mm -hmm. with them as well. And part of what I struggled recently, which I think is kind of why um, when I saw this advertisement for this webinar, I think I received an email um, about it, it kind of hit my radar, is because I've experienced some interesting, I probably wouldn't share this so much if, um, if it wasn't such a small group, but... Um, me, Aaron, before, you <laughs> well, ask, before you ask, I'm recording right now, shall I wrap up the recording and then we'll talk? Oh, yeah, no, I just thought about that, that it was being recorded. I'm not going to say anything um, okay. that can't I just want to protect recorded. you. And, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's been interesting navigating um, the different points of view on how to conduct business yes. um, under the circumstance. Like you talked about, um, Lonnie, you talked about the kind of the third, the 30 percent that is, I think you described kind of like ready to go as the restrictions have been lifted right. to those who are just um, the other third or kind of just to dip in their toe to the third that wants to wait till there's a vaccine. And um, dealing with my own preferences um, and what category I fall into there and my customers um, and kind of trying to align those two as best I can mm -hmm. um, has, has at times been challenging. And I guess I that's a really broad topic, I know, um, and oh, I'm not okay. being really specific in my question, but I would say, like, where you talked about getting a message out about, um, and the human touch, and 
incorporating that into maybe messaging with my clients about um, building trust and that I'm here to listen and to be as flexible as possible. But at the same time, I have certain requirements myself on what I'm comfortable, um, how I'm comfortable conducting business. Um, Absolutely. I, I just struggled. I struggled a bit with how to communicate that um, and navigate that situation without uh, losing any clients. Yeah. So do most of your clients like to be in person? Is that what um, they Well, I have a, a mixed bag um, okay. and it's been the beauty, I guess, and part of my business along with my husband, seasonal electrical contractor, he's an essential business. So um, I was already working remotely. He's been able to continue to work, but uh -huh. I have a couple of clients who wanted me in person that I had to convert to remote and that's worked fairly well. Um, but there, you know, there's a couple that really want it are anxious to kind of um, be doing more face to face. Um, and yeah, I'm not, I'm not completely down for that in certain circumstances. Right. So, yeah. Well, I think you just um, have to, because you know, your business is your business and you don't want to feel uncomfortable when you go and visit and see them. It's not like we're bending. I mean, we go up and beyond, but we don't have to bend over backwards from our, our baseline ethics or what we feel is, is right for our right. selves and our business. So if you, you know, you, you can just, I think you just communicate and if they are adamant about it, just say, well, right now I'm just not um, going out and, and setting appointments in person. Um, I can offer you, you know, the ability to do it through zoom and I'll see you or, or are, are they sensitive because they don't want to maybe give you their information online that it may be compromised? Cause I know sometimes certain, gen, certain, like my mom is this paranoid that someone's going to get into her banking. And that was the whole crust of her, of, the, of their internet, not of, you know, coming and can they get in there if my internet is going to be not working right? And so you have kind right. of you have to figure out why is it in, and you could ask them though, know, right at this point, um, is there any reason why you're, you know, you're thinking that being in person is um, the way that we need to, I need to be able to assist you? Could we, because right now I'm just not doing that um, until, um, you know, until I feel, you know, I don't know how you say it, you have to kind of work on it, but, um, but ask them the question or kind of maybe saying, well, you know, I'm, I, I understand that you may be more comfortable in person, but right now that's not part of what um, I can do. Um, I can still provide you services these ways. Um, so, do any of those look like viable? And then as soon as we are more through this pandemic, then I can set up an appointment for you in person. And you, you just may need to put it there because it's, it's, and if they say, well, no, I'm going to need to find somebody else, then you have to say, okay. And then say, well, I will make sure that I follow up with you when I am taking in person um, uh, clients again and maybe you'll be ready then um you know i i there isn't no, any easy way to do it right right <laughs> and right. i'm a him and a han but um it's okay to say no i'm not taking i'm not meeting in person yet and you don't have to explain to them it'd be more like well what is it that you are feeling that we can't i can't provide you virtually and maybe that's right. where you know turn it around on them Right. I did have that kind of a conversation with one of my clients and um, yeah, and it was interesting to understand a little bit better as to why she wanted to work in person. And it was um, really largely because she's just kind of over all of this, which I, I get. So I empathized with her on that, uh -huh. um, but still kind of held my ground and then debated whether I should put out kind of a... Um, an email to my clients explaining, you know, what I am here for, um, you know, listening and, and yeah. um, extras that I'm providing, but, you know, this is how I'm conducting business um, Absolutely. these days. It, and it, I kind of held off on doing that, but you yeah. think that would be something I should absolutely do? Absolutely, because you, 
can put forward the right message. So you're putting in the right message out, you're giving them all the options, the added value. And at this time, this is how you're conducting business. Everybody is doing that, whether you know, they're essential or non-essential, whether they can open. There's a lot of retailers that aren't opening yet. There's a lot of uh, restaurants that are not opening yet because they haven't been able to make the changes or they haven't been able, you know, they're not feeling comfortable that because they're putting their workforce at risk. So yes, right. I think you should craft the message in a very, you know, honest and, uh, and, and, and just, yeah, send it out before so that the rumor mill doesn't start, heaven forbid. And when we live in these small little rural communities, you know, one person yes. says one thing. <laughs> and so exactly. you drive the message. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a good point to be proactive and drive the message instead of waiting till for something else to fester. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and end it with, I am, you know, I, I am still bringing on new clients. So if you have someone you would like to refer to me, I'm, I have opportunity and I have appointments open. So, you know, you can also add that little bit flavor to it. So you yeah, you absolutely, if you have, um, uh, if you do email and you're, whether it's, you know, a, an email um, in a template using a third party program or just sending out personal emails, I had to call, I, I do for Nevada County for their fair, I do all their entertainment. And of course the fair got postponed, uh, got postponed, got canceled last night. So I, you know, had to put out an email to my, all of the performers, letting them know they weren't going to be hired, but I took it upon myself to also call them and tell them how, you know, I very just, dis I'm as disappointed and sad as you are, but because of this reason it had to be, and you know, it helped that little bit of phone calls kind of helped us kind of bond and still know that I was caring and that the fair cared about them. It wasn't just, and I have to tell you five of my 25 that I hired say, Oh, it's so appreciate you calling and telling me this personally. I was yeah. like, I know because people just don't pick up the phone or send out a personal email. So absolutely drive the message. And Lonnie, right. can I, can I, um, Talk about one other thing with Aaron too, is I've had the same thing where I would meet with clients in person. And then when I started meeting with them online, I thought to myself, oh my gosh, for me, it was so much easier because I wasn't spending so much time in my car that I made right. sure I a different price for in-person versus over Zoom. Oh, that's an interesting point. When I yeah. meet in person, well, just the typical session for me, if I meet someone for an hour on Zoom, I still spend, you know, 10 to 15 minutes before and after. So maybe it's an hour and a half. But when I met with them in person, it was over two hours I was giving them. So I yeah. created a price break. And then if someone was looking for the better price, they're like, oh my gosh, give me the online version. But if they really wanted me to come out and go through things with them in person, they paid a premium for having me in person. Right. That's such a good point. That's a really um, good point. Yeah. I like that a lot. Yeah. Just write that down. And my other question um, was more specifically along the lines of um, marketing via social media. And mm -hmm. um, I, I haven't been um, active on Facebook uh, for a bit now for, um, cause I used to be on Facebook a lot for other reasons, um, more political <laughs> and found it, found it to be um, kind of a, um, a rabbit hole and time suck. Um, I also kind of over, I feel like it's been a bit overused and um, oversaturated, um, I guess. And I wonder what your thoughts are on how effective Facebook um, still really is as a social media platform for marketing your business. And if you feel that others, um, especially maybe in particular to my business are, are maybe more effective. Well, I think that, you know, uh, first of all, website and then email marketing are my two first that I feel are absolutely necessary. Um, mm -hmm. social, social media is just, a, um, and for service-based businesses, it's a little bit different because we can't always be showing a product. You know, you can show yourself so many times or you can show yourself, you know, helping a client. I mean, for myself too, I, I struggle with my social media, with my Facebook business page. Um, because of that, you know, I'm not always want, you can't always just sell yourself. So what, is, what does my audience want? And what I found for me is I, I, I use social, I use my Facebook, uh, Facebook business page to help educate 
my customers. Mm-hmm. Now, you know, they'll get the email and you, and if you're doing blogging or you're doing email, that's fine. And they'll read it and you know, it's, you know, going to them and you're educating that that way, but they can't share it or they can share it sometimes, but it's harder for them to share it. Um, they forward it. Um, your website is where you're really wanting them to land and you're continuously building, you know, your services and you can build that out. So social media is more about building a community, um, doing more about uh, engagement and, and helping the mushroom grow in terms of them sharing it with their, their uh, folks. You know, if you're on, uh, if you have um, an, enough internet presence, you with email and website and with Google My Business, and you're not choosing to social media, that's okay. Um, it, it is um, a, another thing you have to manage. And for I know for service-based businesses or professionals like ourselves, it is much harder to maintain a more robust and we see less interaction growing. And then we find ourselves tendency to be like, moving more on to the personal side and just doing it for personal uh, reasons. But right. also I have found that it helped me when I had to think about content, it helped me kind of see what my comp- competitors were doing or what was, um, what would be relevant in my industry that I could share with my followers that were uh, clients that needed to know about um, certain things like my CPA and my book. I use a CPA cause I just, my, I do my books myself just cause they're, you know, I can, but my CPA, she's not on Facebook, but when all this um, stimulus checks and all of the changes with the, that came down from the cares act, she right. sent out two individual emails to me that to her clients. One was for my business what all this impact meant to me for my business, and then one to us personally. What did it mean for us in our personal tax ramifications? Or what were the changes? In it? And that to me was so valuable, and I saved it. It's in my personal, you know, I bookmarked it um, because I will pull that out when I start thinking about my taxes and what I need her, to, what she'll need to know. But she's not on Facebook. She's not pushing out social media. That's just mm-hmm. not what the, her what she does. So, I yeah. don't think you need it or not. Um, it's more of um, if you you know I would think more using a referral type of uh, basis for your biz type of business. If you're working with you know a, a client and they're you know re- working with them regularly because they're reoccurring and you know when you need to grow your business maybe a referral maybe asking them for a referral uh, we sometimes shy away from that but i don't think you know it that just because we say social media doesn't mean everybody has to be on there as long as people can find you when they google you that's the key if you're on linkedin and you're using that as a as a platform for you to then uh, reach out to colleagues or things like that using that more professional business to, you know, business to business type of uh, social media, as long as you Google yourself, see where you come up and how people find you. Um, that's more important than if you're maintaining a robust Facebook page or Twitter or Instagram. Okay. Okay, great. Yeah, that's good information. I appreciate that. Absolutely. All right, Linda. Do you have a question or two, or are we about out of time? Ooh, we went over it. That's the first thing. We are away. over by a couple minutes, but that was really uh, valuable information. Thanks, Bonnie. Yes, and um, I'll let you close down, and we'll go from there. All right. You want to give me your next slide? <clears throat> I'm sorry. Yes. Thank you. So this is our location for the Shasta Cascade SBDC, and as I said earlier, we're serving Shasta and Trinity counties, and if you are not in one of those counties and you're watching this recording, and you are in the US, go out to Google and search for SBDC locations and find a site near you. The SBDC has advisors that are able to meet with you and we'll do it remotely and soon we'll be able to do it in person again and help you with your business. So know that we're here for you and this is an available service for you. Your tax dollars has already, have already paid for it so you are not going to have to pay for that service. And for those of you that attended 
we would love for you to fill out your survey. In a couple of days, you're going to receive an email from Emily and she'll have the information that um, Lonnie talked about, which is the recording of the session as, along with the PowerPoint slides. And also in there is a survey. If you could please fill that out because that is how we show our effectiveness in running these webinars. And we are very glad that you joined us and hope you join us again for another session. L Lonnie, anything else you'd like to add before we conclude? No, thank you so much for attending, Erin, and best of luck to you. And thank you, Linda, as always, for hosting. Thank you. We will see you next time. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.